Okay. All right. So we're here today for our very first book club session. And my name is Penilla. I, Penilla Yilmam, if you want to be formal, I am a neuroscientist by training. I have a PhD in that. And I am the CEO and founder of Mind Blossom, where we bring mental health education to the people. So when we talk about education, we also want to talk about books. And Sushma and I both love books. Sushma, introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. I'm very excited about this session. Uh, my name is Sushma Srinivasan. I'm the director of programming at Mind Blossom, and I'm an educational and counseling psychologist. We are getting into this book. This is The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk. Penny, do you want to start? Yeah, so this is, so it was published in 2014, and it has been on the bestseller list for, I think it was three years in a row, and it might still be on a bestseller list. This is so popular, and so many people have been inspired from it. So it makes sense that we start out our monthly book club by talking about this incredibly famous book. I read it years ago, and you can see here, all of these are all of the, the little notes that I made in the first round of reading, and I just reread it over the course of a few weeks. But hey, if you're interested in buying this book, you can find the link to purchase it in the comments or descriptions. Um, when you utilize that link, you're also supporting Mind Blossom's mission, so we would really appreciate it if you'd use, if you'd use our affiliate link. Anyway, okay, so this book is in the essence about how our bodies hold on to trauma. To me, that is a very personal and really important topic. I have had a lot of the experiences that Bessel van der Kolk is really talking about in this book. So it felt really pertinent to me. Um, and I really learned a lot. I, I wish I had read this earlier in my life. You just read it for the first time. What was your experience of this book? What did you feel uh, like you really learned from it? Um, so trauma in general has been my favorite topic to research on. And I've read so many studies about ACEs, which is adverse childhood experiences, mm -hmm. childhood traumatic experiences, and historical trauma, PTSD, it's been a very insightful book for me because mm -hmm. I think I got to learn a lot about what your body goes through uh, during, you know, while experiencing this traumatic journey. And uh, something that I, uh, so a lot of research studies actually talk about, you know, how when you have traumatic experiences, there is a, there is an association between traumatic experiences and, uh, you know, even undiagnosed medical conditions mm -hmm. or you know any sen or any sensory you know very somatic sort of symptoms and this book gave me answers to all of those mm. i think that's one of the big problems that are still facing the medical education and psychology education as well is that a lot of these topics that are being discussed in here are overlooked and are not really incorporated into the curriculum when we're training professionals so for example somatic stress, somatic anxiety, how that is rooted in the body and how you're feeling that. You can't articulate, why do you have this stomach ache? Why can't you move your arm or your leg? Why are you so suddenly paralyzed, right? Like it's these big mysteries that we still are not bringing out to the public that there is a link between your lived experience and the way that your body is responding. And uh, Bessel van der Kolk really starts this book out by giving you a an overview of the history of what the field of neuroscience has looked like in psychology as well. And, you know, you get to really recognize that this is still a really new field. We didn't have the PTSD diagnosis until back in the 80s. That's not that long ago, right? Like, what is that now? Like around 50 years ago, that's when we had the first PTSD diagnosis come out there. And to begin with, that was really a consequence of getting all of these veterans back from the First and the Second World War. But then over time, they realized other people, other groups also have these very traumatic stress responses in their body and their mind, the way they're thinking, but they didn't go to war. And so this is when we're starting to think about what is 
complex PTSD, right? But he goes through the iterations and all of the hard work that it took to actually get these diagnoses to be recognized. And there's still the American Psychiatric Association or APA are still pushing back on the role of trauma in various types of mental illnesses. And it's completely mind boggling, just like those first chapters are worth reading from a historical perspective. You know, there's a lot of case studies from his um, from the clients that he has seen. Mm -hmm. So that uh, that that is something that stood out because I felt like I was reading a lot of stories and seeing all of the things being implemented. Okay, how how is your body reacting to this trauma? How how did that affect this client? And it also shows how you know how how it can affect people and the same trauma. Uh, let's take maybe sexual assault, right? Mm -hmm. The same trauma can affect different people in different ways. People might feel different things in their body. And that, that was uh, really uh, something that stood out, yeah. That was one of the reasons that I started studying psychology and neuroscience, because I really wanted to understand what is the difference between people? Why is it that some people are more what we call resilient, while others are more likely to develop a mental illness or other type of um, disease from an experience that they have? And it really comes down sometimes to those genetic factors, but what it comes down to so much more of the time, which is also what he's talking about in this book, is that it's your experiences. So yes, sure, the genes, like they play a huge role and sometimes they can determine, you know, whether or not you're gonna be more susceptible to developing a mental illness, but it's not causation. But if there is one thing we know is that if you grow up in a household where you're being abused regularly, you're probably going to have some sort of response. We don't know which one, but you will be affected. And that is really, to me, a, an outcry for national attention. You know, we need to do better. And he has so many references, really building up his arguments based on the science. I spend a lot of time actually checking out his, sci uh, his scientific uh, references. I'll just show you here an example. So here, for example, there is one of the chapters. This, we're just listing references here. There is nothing but references in on these pages. And sometimes I will circle them out because I think I like, I really got to go and look at that one, you know? Um, so it really, it just makes it feel like you really can trust this book. If just to give an overview of the book, it's divided into three parts where he's talking about the rediscovery of trauma. Then there's your brain on trauma, more about what is, how is your body connected to brain, the connections that it makes, then he goes on to talk about the minds of children where, you know, how is the, what, what's when you're trapped in a relationship, what's the cost of abuse? What's the cost of neglect, right? And uh, developmental trauma. He also talks about that, the imprint of that. And then the best part about the book that's that I really liked is the path to recovery. I think a lot of therapists, uh, not just therapists, anybody who's also working in the school setting, teachers, mental health practitioners, neuroscientists, I think all of them, if they just read the path to recovery, right? I think that would really, like, there are so many things that I learned from this. I'm like, oh, this is something that would really help me out if I am going to an experience like this. And I, Penny, personally, I could connect a lot to the book. I could connect where my, you know, when I think about my traumatic experiences, I could really connect that, okay, my body feels it here. Okay. This is why I have this pain here when I think about that person, right? And it's it's incredible that all of that was put in this book because I just felt like, you know, it was never thought about. It was never, maybe it's written somewhere, but this is the first time I'm reading. And... I read this book in about four days. Uh, <laughs> it's totally insane. It's pretty long, yeah. guys. <laughs> yes. And I also had the audio book. So yes, I was reading it, highlighting the things that I liked, but I also had subscription to the Audible audio book. So you, it's also available there if you want to just listen to it on the go. And yeah, I loved every part of it. I was hooked onto this book. 
yeah th- th- thank you so much for recommending it penny <laughs> <laughs> you're so welcome i mean really i think nobody should go through life without reading this book it's re- it's <laughs> it's really that good and whether or not you care about mental health it's really a good book you should read it because you can't get away from talking about mental health somebody even if you're trying to escape it somebody is going to find you and they're going to talk to you about mental health and this book is an incredible guidance and incredible insight into okay this is what they're talking about this is why it's important and I think especially if you're one of those people where you get annoyed with folks when they're complaining about their anxiety or maybe they have a lot of chronic issues that the doctors can't figure out so like you have a lot of stomach issues or like your wife has a lot of stomach issues and you just find it oh can she just stop it? The doctor said nothing was wrong. Well, maybe this book can give you a perspective on it. Maybe there are some questions that haven't been asked yet that you need to ask them. And that's something that I think is, is important. You know, it's really pointing out there are some of those questions out there that give us a totally new perspective. But you mentioned the ACE study already. So ACE stands for Adverse Child's Experiences Study. And it is a beautiful study that was conducted in the US. It actually started at an obesity clinic. And it came down to the fact that a doctor wanted to better understand what were the associations between early life and then developing um, a larger body and maybe overeating and becoming what is medically obese. Um, And what they found was that a lot of these people have, you know, childhood trauma. And then they could actually go in and see different types of childhood trauma had different effects. But the, the essential part was not, did you have one trauma? Did you have that type of trauma? It was the number of traumas that really made a huge difference. And this ACE study is something that when we go out to community centers or we have virtual courses and we're talking about trauma, the ACE study always comes up, but it's one of the most underreported in the public, which is, doesn't make any sense because it's really about public health and understanding that if a child grows up with both, let's say, sexual violence, abuse, divorced parents seeing their mother getting hurt, they are 12 times or something like that, more likely to develop cancer. They are X amount of times more likely to develop an autoimmune disease. And they're much more likely to become suicidal and get a mental and illness. irritable bowel syndrome also. That is something yeah. that I read. Irritable bowel syndrome. Yeah. And I'm just like, okay, how is your digestive system connected to that? Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and and nowadays we do know that. Like I have colleagues that are studying that interaction between the brain and the gut and the bowels. And we are understanding that there are huge connections there. There are a lot of things that are going on and that the brain can talk to the gut and the bowels and the gut and the bowels can talk to the brain. And so now we're starting to understand, oh, okay, like the food you're eating does really affect the way that your brain is processing information. And that is an essential aspect of brain health. So it's really giving that holistic experience um, when you're reading this book. It's not giving answers to everything, but it's giving a lot of introductions to everything. Something that um, stood out the most for me was also the epilogue, where epilogue is a commentary that is given by the author at the end of the book, um, where he talks about the choices that has to be made. So after talking about, yes, this is how your body reacts to it, these are the paths to recovery, then there's this epilogue. And this hit me the most, also probably because I read it recently, Mm -hmm. it hit me the most, Penny, because he talks about how, uh, you know, even the political systems are involved you know, you can't just talk about trauma without talking about politics. Mm-hmm. You, you know, because if you're not giving sustained, if you're not giving living, household living, substandard living to people, if you're not giving quality education to students, if you're not giving quality um, medication or, you know, uh, things to people, then you can't, not, you can't, you know, talk about trauma without talking about all of that and how uh, trauma plays a huge role in people from the marginalized communities and how politics is again related to that. And another thing that he speaks about in epilogue is also about schools, a lot about schools. Um, I want to specifically, I think, read this one part that I really liked. 
he talks about this the greatest hope for traumatized abused and neglected children is to receive a good education in schools where they are seen and known where they learn to regulate themselves and where they can develop a sense of agency schools can function as islands of safety in a chaotic world they can teach children how their bodies and brains work and how they can understand and deal with their emotions schools can play a significant role in instilling the resilience necessary to deal with traumas of neighborhoods or of families and that is but yeah. that's just in schools where they are cultivating that feeling, right? If you go to school and you're being bullied, or if you're going to school and it's just about academics, it's not about community, you're not going to get those feelings there. I think it's so important, but you work in schools, Sushma. So tell me something about, like, what is that like? Do you see that schools serve as safe islands for your students? Um, with the national policies, it's getting better. Punishments have reduced than when I was studying because there was a lot of corporate punishment in India mm -hmm. before that. And without really considering because they think that's the only way to control a behavior. And I am completely against it. Now it's getting a lot better, but I still see some things happening behind my back. You know, when I go or go to different schools, I still see some of those happening. And I think schools are still... Yes, some of the schools are trying hard to provide a safe haven to students, but unknowingly, unconsciously, they are they are being traumatic experiences to children. It's it's everything, Penny. It's not just you don't just think about the teachers that you hire. You also think about the you know the help that you have in the school, the security that you have in school. Everyone needs to have the same vision to provide the safe haven to children, right? That needs to be there. And that's not something that schools would consider. They would just think about, okay, I'm going to hire quality teachers for academics. And if they want emotional regulation, okay, they're going to also talk about, okay, I'm going to hire teachers who are of that quality. But nobody talks about these other people that are also involved who can also cause this to students. What do you yeah. think? Yeah, 100%. Now, I come from a totally different perspective. I'm from Denmark originally, and that's where I did all my schooling. I didn't move to the US until I was 21. In Denmark, there is no such thing as punishments or corporal punishments at all. People would be aghast if they heard about that. Um, but we have social dynamics. And bullying is a big thing, just like it is in the US, just like it is everywhere. And I experienced maybe not direct bullying and the type you see on TV, but a lot of social exclusion. And then also a lot of clicks, you know, like you belong to one group versus another. And I know I did things that I shouldn't have been doing because I was trying to fit into a group. And so you get all of these different dynamics that make me put into question whether schools can always be that safe haven. I understand that they can be a place where you can get safety from home, but there will be other people there that you'll have to deal with. And that's not always a good thing. So I do put a question mark as to the extent to which a school can really have a huge impact. But with that said, I totally do agree with him that schools can have an amazing impact. What I do think agree with even more are the sections of the book where he's really talking about the importance of doing early intervention for families and really going in and supporting the family units like you were referring to you know having stable housing having food security these type of basic things where like how in the world can you start dealing with your mental health how do you have the time and the resources to do that if you don't even know where you're going to sleep tonight or if you're worried that you're not going to be able to bring food onto the table so these are the types of things that I'm really interested in addressing and then when we get a little bit higher up Maslow's pyramid <laughs> that's when we can start talking about all right well you know, school dynamics. And that's, you know, some people are already there and we need to start talking about that. We should address all of these things right now. But I think addressing the family unit is where we're going to have the most bang for our buck when we're talking about like political investments. And this is exactly why we are doing what we're doing at Mind Blossom. You know, like we're developing uh, mental health education programs that we go in and implement in schools. And the reason for the schools being the site we want to be at, even though I just said that the family unit is more important to me, is because the school is a regulated place where the children will come 
on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So this is a place where we have access to them and we can actually really go in and get access to the teachers and the staff in general, the counselors, the coaches. We can talk to them about like, well, how can you make this a safe place? How can you identify early warning signs? How do you effectively communicate with the kids so that they know it's tr they can trust you, that it's safe to talk to you? Mm -hmm. And how can you then help them if you notice that something's going on? We do this in the schools. We want to do it too with the caregivers, the parents themselves, but it's just totally different landscape to try to get access to the parents. You know, they're busy with their work and everything. So while I just said the schools is not where I would spend my time, it is where we want to spend our time because it's a place where we have an inlet to the children and to some of the adults that play a huge role in those, uh, in, in the kids' lives. It's, all, it's also written in the book. It's sad that families are the ones who are giving us this trauma most of the time. Yes. Most of the things that you see, let it, uh, let's talk about you know, divorce or an assault. Most of it, it gets worse when it's from a family member. And mm -hmm. that, that is something that uh, I think needs to be worked on. But also, Penny, I have a question for you. You know, this is something that has always been lingering. Uh, <clears throat> we when you know when you, when we become parents we would because now we know so much about trauma we know so much about acs we would try to pro, we would try to provide safe haven to to our child right to the children who are around us at least mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time there is also a contrasting opinion that without trauma the person when he grows up to an, to be an adult they wouldn't uh, be able to uh, not not trauma but you know they wouldn't be able to what's the word uh, wouldn't be able to protect themselves when they grow as adults. What do you feel about this on it? Like, it's just mm. something that has been in my head. Mm. I think it's near impossible to protect a child from any type of trauma. Like by the virtue of human beings and the lives we live in, there's probably going to be some sort of traumatic experience. I think what we're talking about now is what sorts of traumas are we trying to protect them from and how severe are the traumas that they're going to experience. So I, as far as I know, was never sexually abused. I had other types of abuse, um, but some people would say, if you're protected from sexual abuse, like that's then the, how could you be able to then understand people with sexual abuse, right? And uh, I certainly can't, uh, but I can sit down and try to understand. And so I think if you grow up and you have an awesome childhood, which I know people that have had that, and they tend to just have awesome lives. And I, okay. you know, I'm nice. jealous. Jealous is uh, <laughs> <laughs> not the best word, but I definitely. Um, I, I do feel jealous like those are the moments where I have felt the most like wow like I wish I had that and but then I also am inspired and I'm thinking wow it's possible because if you grow up around trauma constantly it's easy to think that trauma is inevitable that you have to live in the depths of trauma and it's really not people live beautiful lives without any severe trauma but that child who's now being protected they might um uh, experience other sorts of traumas like I don't know a car crash or losing a friend to cancer or yeah. you know so like now we're talking about grief we're talking about um accidents where maybe you're breaking your limbs uh, maybe yeah. their parents get divorced that's also a Amazing. trauma right so these are the types of things where they will be fine. uncontrollable yeah, yeah hmm. they're uncontrollable you're right I think the better question to ask is how do we equip people to address trauma in all of its senses so that they're ready for it as an independent adult? And that's, we know from science that the best way to do that is to give people manageable challenges. And so as a parent, you want to provide your child with a challenge and say like, hey, you've got to do this. And it's going to be right on the border of where the child feels like they can't do it and that they uh -huh. can do it. And then they master uh -huh. that. And now we're improving their the belief in themselves, which is also called self-efficacy. And then we're pushing that limit. And now we're going to give them a challenge that's a little bit more intense, but is you know, they're up for it because they have the self-efficacy where they believe that they can do this. And then we move that even more. And so if we can build up children's and youth's self-efficacy, 
truly believe mm-hmm. we can also help them better respond to unexpected trauma later in life without having a long history of trauma. Because let's not forget, a lot of the people that do have very severe childhood traumas or abuse, they get, they develop maladaptive coping mechanisms, right? So for myself, for example, I developed an eating disorder and it really was a coping mechanism. It was a way of responding to the stress that I experienced at home and that I wanted to address. I had to unlearn that and learn new coping mechanisms. And so just because you have a long history of trauma does not mean you're going to respond well to it later. So it reminds me of this attachment theory by John Bowlby. Mm -hmm. He talks about uh, how... uh, yeah, how there is a permissible amount of, you know, when, when it comes to parenting styles, there should be permissible, you can't be completely permissible, but at the same time, you can't be completely, you know, authoritative. authoritative. So right. you need to have like that middle ground. What you're referring to now is the attachment theory that Ainsworth and Bowlby were Ainsworth kind of the founders of, yes. and they... Yes. Uh, it's actually written out a little bit in this book, mm-hmm. The Body Keeps the Score. Mm-hmm. So if you don't know what attachment theory is all about, you can look it up in the book and learn more about it. But what Sushma is referring to is that there are these three, four categories of attachment styles that a child can have with their parent, mostly studied between the infant and the mother. And what mm-hmm. we're seeing is that there are some that have the secure attachment, which is the good one. That's the one I didn't have, for example, right? And then there are the other ones that are anxious, um, disorganized, and we also have, or anxious, avoidant, and then we have the the disorganized, which was the really terrible one. Um, Here's the thing, just because you had a few encounters as an infant or a child with your mother or father, where you didn't feel safe in the attachment, does not mean you have an insecure attachment. You can have a secure attachment and still have a few bumps in the road during that. Mm. Just like you can have Mm. an amazing relationship and sometimes you still have some arguments. So it's just about the balance. Hi, sorry to cut you off. I meant to mention this during our conversation, but forgot, so here it is. Along with John Bowlby's theory of attachment, I also want to talk about Diana Bomden's parenting styles. She identifies three types, permissive, authoritarian, and authoritative parenting. Permiss- each, each of these parenting styles provides a unique combination, a different balance of demandingness and responsiveness, which is very crucial for a child's development. For example, permissive parents are very responsive to their child's needs but are not very demanding. Children in this case might grow up in a relaxed environment, in a safe environment, but might struggle with self-esteem in the future. Coming to authoritarian parents, they are very demanding, but are not very responsive to their child's needs. Children in this case would grow up with good amount of self-discipline, but might again struggle with self-esteem. The ideal type of parenting in this case would be authoritative parenting, where there's a perfect balance between demandingness and responsiveness. For example, if a child wants to navigate through difficulties or new challenges, a parent, this parent, authoritative parents would provide support, would provide guidance, would also be there for their emotional needs, but also set clear expectations on what they want and what they don't want. So this perfect balance of providing them with challenges and providing them with support is very important for a child to develop resilience, self-confidence, and good amount of self-esteem. Okay, back to the conversation now. Something that I really appreciate in this book is that he shares his own journey. And so a lot of these professionals out there, like they, they talk about it from a really scientific perspective. And you don't always know if they have personal experience with the topic at hand. Um, I really appreciate that he shares that this is something he grew up around too, that he had trauma at home, that this wasn't an easy life, and that really propelled him into asking these questions. I also think it's amazing that he started medical school and he actually took a sabbatical for one year where he just worked as, I can't remember what it's called, but he had this position where he was kind of the housekeeper of a psychiatric unit and working there, he didn't have like medical responsibilities, but he was taking care of the Mm -hmm. community. He had some incredible observations where he got to really know the people that lived there. He got to know their stories and the challenges and their traumas, 
but he also got to participate in the medical assessments and when the psychiatrist would walk around the units and do roundups. And he recognized that these psychiatrists and fellows and residents were so disconnected from the stories of the patients. That really mm. touched me. I think that I really I love many, many aspects of this book, but I think that's where he really convinced me that he's worthwhile listening to because he took the time to really get to know these people. And I think it's that mm. level of observation that was really the driving force of him changing the field of trauma because that's what he did. Mm. And uh, he also spoke about when he was working, when you mentioned psychiatrists, you know, the medical professionals that were coming there, they wouldn't know their patients. They wouldn't know their the people who are coming in. And they would just maybe get to know them for like a minute or two. And then they would just, okay, give them some pills, which might or might not help. So he, in his book, has given like maybe seven different ways, which and some might work for you, some might not work for you. So I think it's very important for all, like that, which is why I feel like it's a very important read for everyone, because I think everyone who are working with anything close to medical, sorry, mental health, has to read the book because there's no, you know, single step solution for every client. It's not like, okay, this is going to work out. Yeah. Yeah. It, but I, I want to go back and re-correct you. So you corrected yourself. You said uh, anybody who's interested in medical, oh no, mental health. I think anybody who's interested in health, period, should be reading this book. Because if mm -hmm. you're a medical doctor or a nurse practitioner or who knows, mm -hmm. a physical therapist, and you're working with people that have mm -hmm. symptoms of pain, of um, who knows, they can't move a limp in a certain way, this book could be an eye opener for you. It's really giving you some of those insights into, oh shoot, like that's why it's not working. Oh, I gotta yeah. do it differently. And yeah. definitely a, a good read for anybody out there in that professional medical and life world. <laughs> yeah. What is one of the, uh, stick, going back to like path of recovery that you've mentioned, what is something that you really liked? What do you think stood out for you? So I, to, to be completely honest, I think my favorite part was not the path to recovery. Definitely a great aspect of it, but I really mm -hmm. enjoyed the first part, like getting into the history okay. and understanding his journey into this field. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also fascinated for personal reasons by mm -hmm. childhood trauma. So all of those topics typically have mm -hmm. a huge impact on me. Now, with that said, I really enjoy any recovery um, path that is non-medical. So anything mm -hmm. that has to do with, for example, moving your body or going, you know, and practicing in the theater. I think it's, mm -hmm. these are the types of strategies that a lot of people have found out about on their own, but it's not that the medical doctor is going to go out and promote it to you. So I mm -hmm. recently read a paper in Frontiers and, um, and I, I wrote a quick commentary on it on LinkedIn uh, the other day, I think. And what it shows there is when the family unit is exercising together, it correlates with, you know, greater, better mental health within that unit. Mm -hmm. So when you get the parents to exercise together with the children, that's really where you're seeing these positive effects. It's not just wow. exercise, like we're starting to really address the family unit. And I think that's where we're starting to talk about community. And if there's one of my favorite topics out there, it's community. And he is talking about that in so many different aspects. For example, when you go to the theater and you're working there. Mm -hmm. um, but with that said, you know, I think it's really cool when you can stimulate the brain. I'm a neuroscientist. Like these are the types of things I've studied. So maybe that's why they're not making me as much... Uh, Mm -hmm. They're not making me as impressed as they might do mm -hmm. for other people that are unfamiliar with them. Something that I liked was, uh, so I, I've studied about narrative therapy, um, like, you know, during when I was going through my therapy, therapeutic techniques course. And uh, something that I really liked was the IFS model, which is internal family system model, where he spoke about, uh, you know, your mind being divided into these three groups where there's managers, there's firefighters, and then there's these exiles. I really liked it because I could connect a lot to narrative therapy. Narrative therapy talks about externalization, where you externalize from the emotions. 
and here he talks about the firefighters managers being there so that you can you know these are your protective factors that are that is you know trying to protect you but what are you really feeling go back to that traumatic experience and tell me what you are feeling right then i think i could really closely draw a line there which i really liked yeah. yeah it's so funny how many of the topics that we've just talked about were all brought up during our eating disorder course like we yeah. There to treat eating disorders, internal family systems is also a very prominent method. We also talked about the role of, you know, healing through movement and community mm -hmm. and all of these different aspects. Yeah. It's really, really true. It really ranks true all of these paths to recovery for so many different types of mental illnesses. So really, whatever you're struggling with, or whatever your loved one is struggling with, most likely these different techniques could work for you. They're definitely worthwhile testing out. Okay. What do you think are the areas for improvement in this book? Uh, wow. I didn't expect <laughs> that question. <laughs> Let me see. I wrote down so many notes. One second. Okay. Actually, I have one critique. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that comes from the focus on attachment styles. Okay. So one of my favorite things, when I first learned about attachment styles, I was like, oh my God, somebody is describing me. Now, so we have these four attachment styles, the secure, the anxious, the avoidant, and the disorganized. He spent a lot of time talking about what the consequences of the disorganized attachment mm. style was. So at such, the disorganized attachment style is basically the anxious and the avoidant together. You'll also hear some, but some people refer to it as the anxious avoidant attachment yeah. style. Now, the thing is that if you have an anxious attachment style or an avoidant attachment style, that will also have implications on your mental health and your development in general. And mm -hmm. I think more people can relate to the anxious or avoidant category. And so I thought it was a shame that he didn't expand as much on what the consequences of those types of attachment styles can be for certain people, uh, because the disorganized is really where you go to the extreme, right? This is where people have the worst attachment style. Um, it's the one with the worst outcomes. It's the one with the, you know, that's going to take the most time to really treat. Uh, but anxious and avoidant are still also complicated and need support as well. So that's one of one part of the book where I feel like it could have developed a little bit further. How mm. how about you, Susma? Because I've read about some of the theories mm -hmm. before in my, uh, you know, during my psychology training, then I, I could connect to a lot of these, but I still feel like it could be for like a person who's just passionate about reading and knowing about this, it can be a little dense with information. It can be a little more like, you know, when you talk about attachment style, more, you know, more about, you know, more in layman's words, like, you know, just like, just uh, that would, I think, be helpful for people because something that I struggled with was the neuroscience aspect mm -hmm. when there was a lot of, I like, I think the neurofeedback, uh, that uh, chapter was something that I'm like, okay, I reread it twice to like really understand what was happening. Mm -hmm. So I think that was a little too much information for me. So I think, you know, summary at the end of the chapter would really like, you know, just like summary of the key points mm -hmm. at the end of the chapter, I think would really help me there. Yeah, you know, as I'm thinking about it, maybe more graphics. I'm a big fan of visuals. Mm -hmm. So when you're trying to break down, you know, complex scientific input, um, having a graphic where you're visualizing it is always helpful. And I'm I'm realizing now that there are not that many graphics in here other than some mm -hmm. photographs. So something to maybe to consider for a future edition, uh, Bessel van der Kolk, <laughs> if you're <laughs> listening to this. <laughs> um, you know, what you're saying is so important because it's easy for you and I to overlook that. We are so used to that jargon and that complexity that when we're reading yeah. about it, it doesn't feel like that because we have read that language for decades now. Yes. That's where it can be really helpful to maybe seek out some shorter books that are focused on one particular topic. And they're kind of breaking it down, maybe a little bit more at the pop psychology level, which I'm a big fan of. Mm -hmm. uh, with that said, uh, Mind Blossom does have various pamphlets that are going to be coming out soon. So if you're looking to get a, an educational breakdown that is very trustworthy, you can go to our website and you can get it uh, there. You can check out which ones there are and if they appeal to you and you can get them from there. Mm -hmm. 
All right, guys. So this was our first book club series, and we're going to keep talking about this. We're going to weave in our neuroscience and psychology experience. And just a reminder, if you want to get a hold of this book, you can find a link in the comments or descriptions, and you can use that to buy the book and also support Mind Blossom's mission of providing this mental health education to kids, caregivers, and staff. Next month, we'll be releasing another book club recording where we'll be talking about this book here, Healing from Hidden Abuse by Shannon Thomas. And this raised so many questions for me about personality disorders. Can you recover from a personality disorder? Is abuse a choice? Um, so many different questions, kind of controversial. I'm very excited to talk to you about it, Sushma. <laughs> awesome. Have a great day everybody. Thank you.